If you spent any amount of time with my family uh, when I was growing up, you were fairly likely to hear either me or my siblings say, seemingly out of nowhere, quick, what movie is that from? See, my, my family was constantly playing this game that no one else was in on, not just trying to sneak in movie quotes wherever we could, but trying to sneak in the most obscure movie quotes as subtly as possible so that most people around us wouldn't really realize we were even playing a game until we said, quick, what movie is that from? So I want to bring that back for a moment. I want to reach into my childhood and play a little game. Will you all play a game with me? Wonderful. Quick, what movie is this from? Jaws. Come on, okay. Quick, quick on the draw. That's Jaws, yes? All right, let's, let's try another one. Quick, what movie is this from? Okay, yes, we're, we're all on the same page. Y'all are very, very good at this already. There it was. This side got it first. Come on, y'all, y'all don't, don't sleep on me now. All right, a couple more. Yes. All right. Jurassic Park. Not Superman. Indiana Jones. Come on. I've got to shout out Cam, our worship director, because literally in my notes, I have bum, ba dum, bum, bum. And I was planning on doing that, and he's like, you know, there's technology for that, right? I can build that into the slide. And I was like, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, anyone know the link between all these songs I just played? Anyone have any idea what, what link? John Williams, one singular man. Perhaps no one in modern history has understood and harnessed the power of music to greater effect than John Williams. Who else has so many iconic tunes that are instantly recognizable just from the first few notes that you hear completely out of context? He has the most Academy Award nominations of any living person with 54, and he ranks second all time behind some guy named Walt Disney. The director, Steven Spielberg, who Williams has collaborated with on 29 films, once said, I can get an audience to the brink of crying with my film, but Johnny's music makes the tears actually fall. If anyone ought to know the power of music to to stir the human heart, the emotions, the affections, it is John Williams. He's done it again and again and again. He is responsible for, as we just heard, some of the most iconic music in cinematic history, at least. Jaws, Star Wars, E.T., Schindler's List, Fiddler on the Roof, and those are just the ones he won an Oscar for. That's to say nothing of Jurassic Park and Indiana Jones and Home Alone and Harry Potter and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and the list goes on and on and on. And yet, when Williams was asked about the way his music can evoke emotion in, in, a, in an audience in a way that almost verges on manipulation, he responded by saying this. He said, it isn't the music. It isn't the composer. It isn't the orchestra or the audience. It's the connective link between all of that together. He said, composer, I'm just a guy who puts dots on a paper. It means nothing. The conductor conducts, the orchestra plays it, the audience hears it, and it is the interconnection of all of these elements that makes music, music. If I can be so bold as to attempt a paraphrase of one of the greatest composers of all time, I think that what he's getting at is this. Music is inherently participatory and relational. It draws us in and forges new relationships where previously there had been none, and it strengthens bonds that already exist, but that only happens if people are willing to participate in it in all of these different ways. It seems to me that even though Williams composes music for movies and not for the church, his insights are at least worth consideration. I don't think anyone would would argue that Music is an incidental companion of praise. And think about it. You could have gone to a hundred different churches this morning. 
had a hundred different experiences, and I would almost guarantee that in at least 99 of them, music would have played a prominent role in whatever your experience was. It's not an accident. It's not an accident that every church everywhere in the world this morning is, that might have all kinds of, of diversity of opinion, belief, even what's being taught, but we all share music. It's, it's no accident that when you think of praise or worship, music is likely the first thing that comes to your mind. We are in week five of our six-week series called Praise God, in which we are learning together to become a community of vibrant praise using the Psalms as our primary guide. If you remember back, back in week one, we discovered the pattern of praise, that we experience God and we respond in vibrant celebration. In week two, we affirmed that we all have permission to praise God. And for the last two weeks, we've been getting really practical. We've been kind of workshopping some of the practices of praise. And we started with a couple practices that we're probably mostly comfortable with practices of praising God with our voices, the words that we say through singing and speaking and shouting. This week, we are pivoting to look at practices of praising God with our bodies, beginning with making music. Now, if you've been with us every week, you might be thinking right now, like, didn't we already do this one? Didn't Pete preach on singing a couple of weeks ago? And yes, he sure did great job paying attention, gold star for you. Uh, That's absolutely correct. So let me just make a brief distinction. Pete talked about singing specifically as as a way we praise God with our voices, focused kind of on the words that we say, the content of our praise verbally. Today, I want to talk about making music more broadly as a way of praising God with our bodies not just our voices. Now, is singing a part of that? Yes, absolutely. There are muscles in your throat that we use in singing that are not used in any other human activity. God gave you certain muscles when he designed you, knit you together that are only used when you sing. And so if we are to be people who praise God with all that we are, it must include singing. But it's also more than that. Look with me at the beginning of Psalm 149. It reads, Hallelujah, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let let Israel celebrate its maker, let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people, he adorns the humble with salvation. Let the faithful celebrate in triumphal glory. Let them shout for joy on their beds. I love this. This psalm has everything that we have talked about so far in this series. It's got singing. It's got shouting. It even has dancing. And yet right here in the middle of the section, it says, Let them make music to him with tambourine and lyre. Beyond the content of our praise, beyond the the words that we sing or say or shout, we are to praise God simply in the making of music itself. Psalm 149 names a couple of instruments, tambourine and lyre. If you were to allow your eyes to scroll down to the next psalm, Psalm 150, you would also find trumpets and cymbals listed. Now, you've already sat through two fairly loud worship songs with us today, so I don't feel like I really need to convince anyone in this room of this point, so I'm just going to kind of drop it here and then move on. But it is right for us to make music to God with instruments. Lyres and tambourines were the string and percussion instruments of the day of the psalmist. Today, we have guitars and violins and pianos and full drum sets, but the principle is the same. Sometimes we even have a brass section or or Joe will pull out his saxophone like on Easter or something, and that's always a good time. So it is right for us to to make music to God using instruments, but the question bears asking, why music? 
Like of all the things in the world, why this thing? And on one level, the answer is extremely simple because God commands it. God commands us to make music, and that's absolutely true. God wants it. God desires it. But why? Of all the things God could require of his people as a way to give him our praise, our love, our affection, our devotion, why melody? Why music? I find this question to be fascinating, particularly because you can scour the pages of Scripture and I don't think you'll find a clear answer. The command is there. The the gift of music is there. It's a constant companion of God's people in praise, but the reason for it isn't really articulated. So let me give it my best shot. Could it be that music is a gift God desires from his people because it is first a gift that God desires for his people. A worship pastor I used to serve with once told me that the reason he loved music so much is that it was apparently completely without utility to humankind in terms of like most basic survival. Yes, there's all kinds of health benefits and mental, like mental and physical health benefits when it comes to music, but like the singing of songs does not directly help people raise up future generations or survive like as a species if you wanna look at it that way. He, he said, there is no reason that humans should have come to be musical creatures except that God designed us to be that way. God gave us the ability to recognize and respond to and create and communicate through music, apparently for the sole purpose of requesting music from us. He gave us the ability to make music so that he might receive our praise through music. God wants music from you because God wants music for you. Musicians and mathematicians alike will tell you that music is literally universal, that it is embedded, woven into the very fabric of nature and reality. The the eight-part scale, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, is the same wherever you go in the world, in every culture, every language. Music unites us because God designed music and then wove his melody throughout all creation, a consistent melodic line wherever we turn. He gave it to us as a gift that both reflects the human heart and moves the human heart in a way that is basically unparalleled in the human experience. Music is a a gift from God, a, a tool for shaping and expressing and making sense of our experiences as humans created in the image of God, living in a fallen world. So what does music do? Well, well, music is a tool for personal expression. I think that's clear. How many of us have felt the satisfaction when our sort of internal state, whether it be happy or sad or angry or contemplative or peaceful or excited, when that internal state is reflected and mirrored back to us through a melody rather than lyrics? Or how many of us have have tasted just a little bit of what the Apostle Paul talked about when he said, we don't know how to pray, and the Spirit intercedes for us in groanings that are too deep for words. How many of us have tasted that when we've heard a tune that so deeply resonates with your spirit that you can't even articulate why it's making you feel the way that you feel, but it turns your heart and your mind back to God? Alfred Hitchcock is quoted as saying that music represents the words that cannot be spoken. Not the ones that aren't spoken, but the ones that simply cannot be. They cannot be articulated. We sometimes express ourselves better with a wordless melody than with a wordy monologue. But music is also a tool for personal formation. Right? It not only reflects how we feel, it actually has the power to change how we feel. It can shape our hearts and minds toward a person or an idea or a story or a topic, ourselves or even God. This is why political campaigns use music. And this is why every political campaign 
that's worth its weight in fundraising is very intentional about the music they choose to employ because they know music can make you feel a way about a person that a policy proposal never will. Music can convince you that this person you fundamentally disagree with is actually kind of on your side because they're just just like you. Music is formative. And it's much more so when you actually participate in the creation of the music. Just as kind of an aside, for this reason, it is extremely important that we take great care in deciding what music not only we consume, but what music we participate in, what music we sing along to, what what music we, we clap to or drum along to or tap our foot to. Because music is not merely something that we do. Music does something to us. It has a a unique ability to shape us. And I don't want to get us off track and say too much about this, but I heard a pastor one time recommend, if you're struggling to know, like, is the music I'm listening to really good for me? Pause the music, print out the lyrics, and read them out loud in front of your family without any melody, without any music in the background. And if that makes you uncomfortable, maybe find a different playlist. Maybe that's a, a tool for some of us that we can use. Music does something to us. And that same truth can be used both for good or for evil. It depends on what the music is directing us toward, right? Music can be a gift that lowers our inhibitions or barriers that we put up from experiencing God and giving our whole selves to him in worship. But it can also be a tool of destruction, a Trojan horse carrying in destructive thoughts and feelings into our hearts. And so we have to be intentional about the music we create and participate in. But I don't want us to get so caught up in like warnings against the bad music out there that we miss the point of Psalm 149 because actually Psalm 149 is not warning us against anything. It is instead a positive invitation into something that is good and beautiful and life-giving for us. It's inviting us to make music to praise God. Now, you might be here and you're thinking, That's fine, but I don't play music. I have no ability (laughs) to play music. I I, like maybe uh, I had a a family friend when I was growing up that said, I can play an iPod, which is now a very dated reference, just not all that long lit. But maybe you're like, yeah, I can play Spotify, and that's about the extent of my musical ability. Thank you very much. I've got friends that play music. I've got people in my church who can play music so that I don't have to. All that's fine. You don't need to play an instrument in order to obey this command. But, but don't deceive ourselves into thinking that this isn't a command for God's people. Making music is something that we are all invited to, not selectively for those of us with the best rhythm. Instruments will be part of our worship and community. And if you choose to learn one, I think that would be enriching for you personally. It would probably benefit your family or your friend group. But just because you can't play an instrument doesn't mean you can't participate in praising God through making music. If we think back just for a moment to William's kind of four-part paradigm for what makes music music, he named conductor, or composer, conductor, orchestra, and audience. If we were to overlay that onto our experience of worship together as a church family, where are we? in that paradigm. Who are we? I'll tell you who we are not. We're not the audience. That's actually kind of the one option that's not available to us. When we all come together to sing praises to God, none of us are on the receiving end of those songs. We don't come to listen to a band play. We come to join in the praise with all of God's people. So God is the audience, the only audience of worship. I think there's also a case to be made that God is the composer, that he writes his praise on our hearts. He pens his glory in all creation, and all of our praise is simply responding to God's initiative. So that leaves us with two options. 
We're either conductor or orchestra. Oftentimes, I think we think of the people up here on the platform as the orchestra. But if anything, I think the worship team is more like a conductor and the congregation, the community. We are the orchestra. We are the ones who who receive what someone else has written. We follow the leadership of someone and we give whatever we have to the audience. We are the ones who are called to create music given to God, all of us together. But how do we do that if we don't play instruments? Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Let me, let me just read that again. Clap your hands, who? You can see, all you peoples. That is an all-inclusive label that no one escapes from. Clap your hands, all you peoples, and shout to God with a jubilant cry. God has given us all an ability to make music, even if you have no instrument and even if you have little to no rhythm. I will come back to that in just a moment. Let's put a pin in the, in the rhythm issue. But God has given you the ability to make music if he has given you hands. Clap your hands, all you peoples. That, that means you, mister, like, I only play Spotify. And miss, oh, well, I'll, I'll just let the worship team do it. No, no, no. All of us can join in if we can clap. In fact, if there is anything more universal and unifying than music itself, it is clapping. Think about, I don't know, the last sporting event that you went to or, some, or something like that. People try to sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game in the seventh inning stretch. Sometimes people try to sing the national anthem with varying degrees of success. But, but many of us can't find the beat, not to mention the tune. But even people that don't have rhythm get into the slow clap, yes? Eight of us. That was really good. I appreciate you. I appreciate y'all. Or the chant, like, let's go our team. Let's go our team. My favorite version of that chant, this is is not in my notes at all, but my favorite version of that chant I ever heard was when I was, it was our high school football team. We were in the playoffs playing against like Eastside Catholic or something like that. And our uh, very not Catholic school uh, was just trouncing this other school. And the student section started, started chanting, God's on our side. And it continued until the administration came over and started like threatening suspensions. A wonderful moment of, of high school bliss. Anyways, everyone can join in clapping. An article from the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, which I'm sure you all read all the time on the weekends in your free time, said this, as exotic as it sounds, clapping sounds are quite literally as contagious as a disease. They go from one person to another, synchronizing between unknown persons like fire in a forest. It is its power of imitation and synchrony, that is, the ability to do things at the same time with other people, is rivaled only by the famous Mexican wave phenomenon that we see in stadiums. People do the wave all around the bowl. Studies have shown that people can easily coordinate their claps, but replicating such coordination with something else like jumping is considerably more challenging. Clapping is a way that almost everyone can participate in making music even if you have little to no musical ability. God designed your palms to make a percussive noise when they come together in a way that he did not design your elbows or your knees. Your hands are literally created to clap to God. Biblically speaking, just as is true in our culture, Clapping can communicate a number of different things. You know, sometimes clapping is used to call out someone else for sin or injustice. You can clap at someone, yes, to call someone, or you can clap back 
to, to call attention to, to hypocrisy, maybe. That's biblical. Other times, clapping is, is an outward expression of an inward joy. Or, or maybe it's a celebration of something that has been done, like a, a victory that has been won. Or sometimes it's just simply an act of making music to God. Most often, in the context of praising God through our music, our clapping will be a, a, an expression of joy and celebration and something in line with like what Hebrews 13 says, offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Or Romans 12, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Clapping, moving your body in worship to join in the making of music is a practical way that you can live out that biblical command. Offer your body. How do I do that? <laughs> Offer my body as a living sacrifice. That is why we clap and make music. Now, I want to have a little bit more fun. I realized that this sermon was going to be maybe a little bit of a stretch. And not just that we don't want to clap. I realized, like, how, how can you have a whole sermon on clapping? And so I knew that we were going to have to, like, loosen up a little bit because this is not me putting like imposing some new form of legalism onto us as a community this is simply an invitation to loosen up a little bit to to even have fun while we're worshiping God because I think God desires our joy and not just our seriousness and so will y'all have a little bit of fun with me for a moment all right I want to invite Ben up here uh, Ben is going to come join me and we're going to talk about how to clap okay uh, this might seem a little bit remedial, but some of us need it. And I don't want to call anybody out, but you know who you are, okay? So to be inclusive of everyone, we have to assume nothing. So this is Ben. Everyone say, hi, Ben. Hi. Ben is a member of our church, and you probably recognize him through that drum cage for the most part. Uh, he drums most weeks for us and serves our church uh, with great uh, Wow, readiness. Like you're always willing to serve and to sacrifice your time. So can we just real quick thank Ben for serving? You all just gave yourselves away. I know you can clap now. So now you have no excuse at all. All right, Ben's going to go back to the drums. He's going to play a couple beats for us. While he gets set up, let's just go over the basics, all right? The first step of clapping is you have to have both hands out of your pockets and your coffee set down. I know, I don't wanna to get too controversial right off the bat, this is gonna press some buttons and upset some people, but you do have to have your hands free, otherwise it's, it's physically impossible to clap. Now, are your hands free? Let me see your hands, yes? Beautiful, wonderful. We're doing like jazz hands for some reason together, I don't know why that was not planned, but Ben is gonna play just a few beats for us and we are gonna learn how to clap along just on a, a simple, like the most basic level, okay? So most songs that we sing together as a church are in 4-4 four, four time. 4-4 four, four time means there's four beats per measure, the quarter note gets the beat. Some of you think I just started speaking a different language. That's totally fine. These are songs that have a feel of one, two, three, four. One, two, three. This is like 80, 85, 90% of the songs that we sing together, all right? The simplest thing to clap along to is when the drummer does what we call four on the floor. That's just like one, two, three, four with the bass drum. So, so Ben's going to give us some four on the floor beat. Go for it. And we're going to clap. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. Look at you all. That was, you even kept going when he stopped. That's amazing. We're growing in the Lord together. This is, this is encouraging. All right, we're going to get one step harder. Instead of clapping on all four, we're going to clap on every other beat. Now, now, this is where most of us run into problems. So let me just clarify. When we clap, the socially acceptable thing, the loving thing to your neighbors around you is to do your best to clap on the two and the four. That proves tricky occasionally. So, uh, let me, can, can we actually do what we talked about, the uh, We Will Rock You? Because you all can clap on two and four because everyone can clap to this song, right? This is one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. OK, 
Okay, that's good. Yeah, someone started singing. That's what I was trying to avoid. Uh, no. uh, I talk to people and they're like, I don't know how to clap to two and four. Yeah, you do, because you can clap to queen. Okay, so like we can get there. Some are just easier than others. So just give us like a standard four, four time beat and we're gonna find the two and the four together, all right? All right, ready? Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, yeah. If you wanna get really advanced, you can start like throwing in. Okay, now I'm messing. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's see, this is fun. Are we having fun together? Yeah. I'm enjoying this. All right, now we're gonna do my favorite time signature, six eight time. That's six beats per measure. The eighth note gets the beat. That doesn't matter to any of you. But uh, give us give us a feel for what six eight time feels like. One two three four five six. One two three four five. This can be tricky. All right, I want us to to clap on the one and the four, all right? So it's gonna be like, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four. Yeah! You got it, that's fine. If you don't feel like clapping on six, eight time, if you can't find it, that's okay. The great thing about six, eight time is that barely anyone can find it. So like whenever you clap, people aren't really gonna know if you're off or not. Uh, sometimes though, we sing songs in six, eight that are like a little more driving. This would be like, Praise to the Lord. Can we do praise to the Lord? Two. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three. On this one, you can just clap on every beat. Four, five, six. One, two, three. All right. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Yeah, you guys got it. This is fine. All right. Last one. Come on, Pete. Last one, and this is the trickiest. Uh, we're gonna do three, four time. All right, so, so Ben, give us, give us uh, in Christ alone, three, four time. All right, who knows when to clap to this one? Yeah, all right, that's good, that's good. Don't clap to three, four time. Don't try. To clap to three, four. There is a way to do it, but it's not accessible to the average, uh, you know, musical knowledge person. And so just, if, if you're like, I can't find the fourth beat, it's probably because there isn't one. It's just one, two, three, one, two, three over and over again. So don't clap to three, four times. How are we all feeling? We feel a little bit more confident. In, in all right, thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. I texted him like earlier this week. I was like, I've got this crazy idea. You down? He goes, are we going to try to make people sing and clap at the same time? Because that might... I hope you got what we're doing here. I wanted to playfully show you that clapping is easy. And that even if you don't have great rhythm, it doesn't really matter because the drums are mic'd and your hands aren't. Right? Like, like Ben will carry us even if you're not quite sure when to land the clap. If, if you want, you can do what Pastor Dave does. And I... Well, I, I guess I didn't get his permission to share this, but I shared it in front of him and he didn't object. So pa Pastor Dave, he, he's not the most musical guy and he will tell you that. Sometimes he struggles to sing and clap at the same time. So occasionally what he'll do is he will stop singing to just focus on clap because if he's not doing two things at once, he can find the beat and he can clap. And sometimes for him that feels like a better expression of praise and celebration of God in that moment. And I just want you to know, you have permission to do that. That is absolutely fine. But for most of us, if we don't clap, it's not because of our rhythm or lack thereof. What keeps us from participating in creating music, making music and clapping? I, I think there, there are two things, at least that I hear most often. One is that we feel apprehensive about appearing to clap for people instead of God. I, I hear this both from the pews and from the band, actually on a fairly normal basis. Like, it makes me a little uncomfortable when we clap after songs, because it feels like we're clapping for the band instead of God. And I get that, but do you know the solution to that? It's very simple. 
clap for God. Like, the solution to feeling tension of like, I don't want to be clapping, I don't want to give my praise falsely to man instead of God, which is a good impulse. The solution is not to stop clapping and to withhold from God the praise he is due. The solution is to fix your own heart posture toward God. To have your motivation be toward God and not for the band, not for the preacher. Because if you're clapping for God, you've solved the problem. And while we're at it, we could probably just stop presuming or trying to discern other people's motivations around us. What if we came to church just expecting that everyone was coming with the right motivations just like you? All of a sudden, we're all clapping in celebration of God, and it doesn't feel weird anymore. In fact, I think if we're clapping for God, we'll probably clap more often, which means that it won't feel as awkward when the song ends and like that's the only time we clap together in church. When, it, when it's more fluent, when it's part of the culture, then it's all directed toward God. If you are consistently celebrating God's goodness, we find ourselves clapping more and not less. But, but for many people, clapping and making music feels Hard. We, we, we resist joining in, clapping and making music in worship because it feels fundamentally at odds with our circumstances in life. We feel this tension. And this has been one of my consistent prayers through this sermon series. I, I am fully aware that in a church of our size, when we're spending six weeks talking about praise, and being like pretty positive and pretty happy clappy, there are going to be some people who have some bad seasons of life that intersect with these six weeks. And I know that that is true because I've been one of them. In fact, since, since we've been planning this series going back a couple of months, both my grandmas were in and out of the hospital. And week two of this series, both my grandmas died within 38 hours of each other. I, I, there have been other things going on in the life of my family. I just had a conversation with a family member yesterday that I think will probably fundamentally change the fabric of our relationship at least for years, if not forever. I know the tension between the realities of life and grief and loss and sadness and this invitation to praise God because he is worthy. And I cannot begin to tell you what a gift these weeks with you all celebrating God have been in the midst of a hard season of life. You do not have to wait until your circumstances change before you start praising God. It does not have to be that way. Psalm 149, where we started our time today, if you, if you read it in its entirety, you will realize something about it. Psalm 149 is a victory song. But if you analyze it, what the most interesting thing about it is that the celebration is at the beginning and the victory is at the end. The, the celebration starts before the victory is fully enacted. It's, the celebration is happening starting right there in verse 1. Hallelujah, sing to the Lord a new song. But the victory isn't finalized until all the way down in verse 9. And I think that what this psalm is trying to tell us in its very structure is that because God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we do not have to wait to celebrate his victory. We do not have to wait to sing and shout and dance and clap. We can celebrate before we fully see the victory come into our own lives. Zach Bolin is, a, is the lead singer of a band called Citizens, which some of you may be familiar with. When I was a senior in high school, I got a chance to hang out with him one time and just pick his brain on worship music and, and worship leading. I went to the church where he was leading worship up in Seattle and sat in the service for the first couple of songs. And then as soon as the front set was done, we bounced. We went out. Uh, he set a timer on his phone for how long the sermon was going to be. And we went and grabbed some pizza to eat. And he just kind of let me ask questions about his kind of philosophy of worship leading. And we talked for like 45 minutes, and one thing stuck out to me, and it still sticks with me to this day. He said that for him, one of the primary jobs of the worship band, and by extension, 
primary jobs of the local congregation in singing is to declare the victory of God in the midst of the ongoing battle. He painted this picture of kind of an army band. I imagine something like from the Revolutionary War era, led by a drummer with a snare drum, marching through the territory to announce the victory that had been secured somewhere else. And he said, whenever the band enters a new village, the reality of the war, the reality of the battle is still more real to those people than the reality of the victory. They can't see the effects of the victory yet, but the band comes in to assure them that the victory is certain and to invite them to begin living in light of the victory even though they can't see it around them yet. Friends, our victory is secure, not merely because it's promised by a trustworthy God, it is, but also because God has already kept his promise. He has already won the victory in the life, death, resurrection of his son, Jesus. And that victory does not just belong to Jesus because he has shared it with all those who have been unified to him through faith. His triumph is ours through faith, which means that we have all the more reason to clap and make music and declare victory than the psalmist did. So clap your hands and make music, church, because Jesus has won the victory. Don't don't clap because the music is good. Clap because Jesus is victorious. When we clap and make music, we are embodying, literally. We are showing forth with our bodies the victory of Jesus in the gospel. We are announcing to the watching world the victory of God over the powers of sin and death. We are bringing the light that casts out darkness and the love that casts out fear. When we clap and make music, we fly the flag of the kingdom of heaven, announcing to the dead and dying kingdoms of the world the good news of a good king who has overcome the world. When we clap and make music, we walk in procession into prison camps proclaiming freedom for captives. We we stand up and strip down the slave block of its power while declaring liberation for those who have been bound and held down in sin. We head into hospitals as heralds of hope in the midst of pain and struggle and we march into morgues with the message of resurrection. When God's people make music, In the midst of a broken world, we are not merely pointing forward to the restoration that we hope for. We are partnering with God to bring about the restoration of all things here and now. Friends, when God's people clap, the earth rejoices and the enemy trembles because he knows his days are numbered. So let's stand and respond together to the victory of our good God. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a jubilant cry. For the Lord, the Most High, is awe-inspiring, a great king over the whole earth. He subdues peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chooses for us our inheritance, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God ascends among shouts of joy. The Lord, with the sound of a ram's horn, sing praise to God, church. Sing praise. Sing praise to the king. Sing praise. Sing a song of wisdom, for God is king over the whole earth. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the peoples have assembled with the people of the God of Abraham. That's us. For the leaders of the earth belong to God. And he is greatly exalted. Clap your hands, all you peoples, for our God has won the victory.